We welcome our Nigerian viewers and viewers around the world. This is Business Week, where we offer you unique insights to the economies around the world and, of course, with a focus here on the continent, Africa. I am Kelly Egiga, and I'm reaching you from Lagos, Nigeria's commercial capital. Our focus this week on the show is the 2023 budget presented by President of uh, Nigeria, uh, President Mohamed Buhari, just before the Senate about a week ago. And of course, uh, that budget has generated a lot of uh, controversies and talking points from analysts and experts who are worried when I take a look at uh, that particular presentation by Mr. President. We'll see how we can dissect this budget in just a moment. That will form the crux of our conversation on Business Week. But first things first, let's uh, do your reminder of some of the stories that made headlines last week in the world of business. We're back in just a moment. Stay with us. The eighth and final budget presentation by President Muhammad Buhari, as his administration winds down in another seven months, the President of the Senate commends both arms of government for the return of the budget cycle to between January and December in the last three years. Hamad Lawan and Speaker Femi Gwajabi Amila acknowledged the trouble with the nation's economy arising from death of revenue, but the massive stealing of crude, which has impacted negatively on the nation's economy, leaves much to be desired. They insist crude thieves are enemies of the country and should be treated as such. The thieves have declared war on our country and our people. I strongly feel that we need to take the necessary measures to stop the thieves immediately. Otherwise, our economy will be completely devastated. Also, our efforts to provide the necessary infrastructure and diversification of the economy would both be thwarted. It is time to take drastic and desperate measures against the thieves. It is the sense of the House of Representatives that those engaged in these activities are agents of economic sabotage, determined to bring our country to its knees. Therefore, our position is that their actions constitute treason against our country, for which they and their enablers, whoever they may be, must be held accountable to the fullest extent permitted by law. For 55 minutes, President Mohamed Buhari takes a prospective look at the efforts of his government at reshaping the country for the current budget, as well as projections for the coming year. Transformational investments in infrastructure tops the list of his administration's achievements. The president says a challenging global economy, high inflation, high crude oil prices, and Russia-Ukraine war have contributed to the nation's troubled economy. Right. Nevertheless, he says government is determined to show up its revenue from taxation and the internally generated revenues of MDAs. Our interventions and revolutionary measures have been very effective and impactful. We must, however, continue to work towards achieving much higher levels of growth, especially given our high population growth rate, so that the average Nigerian can truly feel the impact of planned economic growth. The parameters for the proposed budget include oil price benchmark of $70 per barrel of crude, daily oil production at 1.69 million barrels per day, inclusive of condensates of 300,000 to 400,000 barrels per day, exchange rate of 435.51 Naira to U.S. dollar, and a projected GDP growth rate of 3.75% and 17.16% inflation rate. The president also touched on the current ASU strike and renews his appeal to university teachers to return to class. He says education cannot be solely funded by the government. In the determined effort to resolve the issue, we have provided a total of 470 billion naira in the 2023 budget from our constrained resources for revitalization and salary enhancement in the tertiary institutions. Well, this week, my guest is Mr. Roman Osegale. He's a business and economy intelligence analyst, and he joins us on the program. Thank you so much, Mr. Roman, for agreeing to speak with us on this edition of Business Week. Thank, thank you, too. 
Thank you. Yes, just before we get into the numbers and stats or figures of the budget, I, I wonder if you followed the presentation by, by Mr. President uh, only last week. Uh, it's a budget of 20.51 trillion naira. I wonder what your initial thoughts and assessment of that budget is at this time. Well, um, I, I watched it and um, obviously it's, not, it's nothing new. It's the same process. Uh, you present the budget to the National Assembly, it goes through screening and then probably maybe approved. And the National Assembly will definitely uh, decide to either approve or probably adjust it and make the recommendations back to the presidency, right? And before it becomes law. So uh, I think it's, it's basically the same thing that happens every year. But uh, I think this year the, the, the numbers were a bit, you know, they're, they're a bit uh, staggering. Well, Mr. Roman, I, I mean, I know that you're vast with issues around budgets. You've been following our budgets for quite some time. Perhaps you could help us do a comparative analysis of some of the budget uh, presentations uh, with, with experience in the last maybe eight to ten years. I would like to address the budget on a very different way, right? And um, to do that, I'd like to explain what I mean. Um, to appreciate a number, you probably have to compare. When you do that, you definitely see things from a clearer perspective. It tells us about the Nigeria's annual budget, total expenditure in Naira in trillions year by year from 2014. And the reason why I started from 2014 was because uh, that's when Nigeria started having its trade deficits. Right? Now, if you look at the budget in 2014, it was just uh, 4.7 trillion Naira. And then the budget in 2023, it's uh, 20.51 trillion, right? Now, but one of the things I've also noticed is that, um, and which we should not get carried away by, is the trillions of Naira that we keep hearing. Uh, the reality now dawns on you. Uh, you look at uh, budgets in dollar terms. In 2014, um, Nigeria's budget, as in dollar, was 29.34 billion US dollars. And uh, in 2023, the, the, the budget we're talking about now is 47.15. But before it got to 47.15, you need to look at what has been happening. 2014, it was 29.3 billion. 2015, 27.23 billion. 2016, 30.76. 2017, 23.9. 2018, 29.90. 2019, 29.25 billion. 2020, 30.03 uh, 30 billion. 2021, 21.89 billion, right? Now, that means if you look at these numbers carefully, the numbers have been hovering around 29 to 31, right? For straight eight years. Now, your budget, the annual budget of every country is the economic instrument which is used for the expansion of the economy. Now, with the size of that of Nigeria and just only having a budget that hovers between 29 to 31 billion for eight years, it's, it's, it's nothing to write home about. And that's why the economy is not expanding the way it should because we have a lot of constraints. We have, actual, we have uh, a funds constraints to actually pump into the economy, to expand the economy the way the economy should actually expand. So we're just going to be struggling through. It wasn't until 2022 that the budget moved up to 41 billion and then in 2023, it moved up to the, the proposed budget now at 47 billion. For me, I, I see it as it, 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 it's not appropriate at all for the, the size of the Nigerian market and the size of the Nigerian economy. We need a bigger budget. We need a, a, a budget that will be able to impact and expand our economy. But before we can do that, we also need to look at uh, how to raise the money. How, how, where are we going to get the money from? So it all boils down to the, the government not being able to get enough funds to inject into the economy or inject into the uh, budget that will eventually impact the economy.
All right. So there's also the issue around uh, budget deficit. I mean, it has jumped from uh, from six trillion, which we saw in the 2022 budget, to uh, to over 10 trillion naira, as we've seen in the 2023 budget, and we're seeing uh, we're having a serious budget deficit. I wonder just how of how much of a concern this this is to people like you, who are experts and of course analysts, uh, and, and then very vast with issues around budget. It's a huge concern. Now, why are we having budget? The, the major thing that we need to talk about is why are we having budget deficits in the first place, right? Once your trade deficits, once you start having trade deficits, you start having budget deficits. And why do you have trade deficits in the first place? Because you're over concentration on one commodity that brings over 90% of your external earnings, right, is dwindling away and it's the, the, the world market is no longer buying crude oil in the quantities they used to buy. So you have a commodity that is going out of fashion and is creating a trade deficit for you. So once your trade deficit starts to increase, the, the next thing is that your budget deficit will start to increase. And between 20, that same 2014 and 2021, Nigeria has recorded over 106 billion US dollars in trade deficits. So those are the things that you're starting to see in the budget. But by and large, going back to your question, it's a major concern because we also need to look at the, the fact that are we able to service this debt? I did an analysis, um, budget deficits. So our budget deficit is about 52.65% of the budget this year, which is, which is huge. So that means that a lot of the revenue, right, that you're going to be making from this small crude oil that you're selling is going to be going into servicing of your debt. All right, so you have mentioned uh, issues around our crude oil production. Maybe we should just uh, take a look at that because the oil benchmark has been placed at $70 per barrel. But um, daily oil production, for instance, which is a major, major concern for us, has been placed at 1.69 million barrels per day. As a country, we're unable to even meet our OPIC uh, quota or target, which is, is uh, 1.8. And so when you take a look at the budget, I'm saying 1.69 million barrels uh, uh, per day. I wonder just how realistic is uh, this target, if we're unable to meet the 1.8 targets or quota set for us by OPIC? Okay, so for me, uh, my conclusion on that is like, it is, it's a double-edged sword, right? The more you pump out, the prices fall, right? The, when OPEC cuts down, prices increases. So it depends on what you want, right? But at the end of the day, it also boils down to demand and supply. The amount of crude oil that you've been given a quota for, is there a demand for it in the international market? That, those are the things you need to look at. If there's no demand, at the end of the day, OPEC's quota, uh, OPEC's quota is just going to uh, push oil out and then it will, will go into an oil gloss, right, which will eventually uh, drop the prices. So you may be pumping lower than what you're supposed to be pumping and making more money because your 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 the, the, uh, sorry the, because the supply right is less than the demand and the prices are high so at the end of the day nigeria just needs the opec and nigeria they need to weigh and look at the figures if we pump 1.8 million what are the projected prices that we're going to get out there right and at the end of the day even if the prices are good right but how does it affect the economy on the long run those are the things that we, we need to make projections on Yes, yeah, so, so there are also issues as to the role the international community plays um, in, in, our, in our crude oil production. I mean, the U.S. over the years have also stopped uh, uh, buying crude from Nigeria or has reduced uh, buying crude uh, from Nigeria. I mean, I'm also just curious and anxious if the international community perhaps shuts down on our crude oil or shuts down on buying uh, from Nigeria, which is one of the largest... Uh, producers in, in the world. What would happen to our economy? Oil will always be in demand, but it's just that it's going down, right? Now, every economy repositions itself 
because of technology. We all know that uh, the, the first industrial revolution was about steam engine, right? Now, coal was in high demand then. Then came the second industrial revolution, right? That was now about combustion engine. Crude oil came into effect, but it didn't completely wipe out coal. There are some reactors and some uh, energy generating uh, uh, sites in the world that are still using coal to generate electricity. But the demand, it's, 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 it's next to nothing. You understand? So we are also heading, crude oil may be heading the direction of coal. If you look at it, uh, in Europe, you have about, uh, at, at the end of 2020, there were about 250 million cars in Europe. And Europe is telling you by 20, the European Union is telling you by 2035, which is just about 12 years away, we don't want fossil fuel cars on the roads anymore. So just imagine wiping out demand from 250, cars, uh, 250 million cars on the road. For the first time in three years, Norway bought more electric cars than fossil fuel cars. So the trend is out there. You just need to sit down. And if we had um, leaders that probably maybe were doing these things, right from the year 2000, we were supposed to have started diversifying the economy because the world kept on preaching renewable energy, renewable energy. And once things like that start coming up, all you need to do is call the leadership of a country, the economic team, the think tanks, okay, you know what, this is where the future is headed and how are we able to survive the future if we do not diversify the economy? And if we do not diversify the economy, we list out the major advantage, sorry, disadvantages and then the, the, advantage, the advantages of diversifying the economy and how we can push that agenda. We're supposed to have been doing that 20 years ago. But right now, the whole thing is catching us on our ways. Well, f fascinating insights, Mr. Roman. I mean, let's, let's begin to wind on our conversation. Uh, so the budget has been questioned, the budget of uh, consolidation and transition. That's because uh, th there'll be a new administration in 2023. I, I wonder in terms of implementation, what, the, what uh, this would mean for the new administration. Uh, and of course, when you also take a look at uh, some of our budgets over the years, just how much has implementation uh, been a major, major barrier? I said this earlier, I said, look, the budget, you, you, you just need to convert it to dollars. And when you con uh, convert, convert it to dollars, you start to see the realities in it, right? Now, look at the education part of that budget. Everything was about, uh, I think, two point, when I converted it using the exchange rate for the budget, it was about $2.8 billion, right? Now, the fire department in New York I'm not talking about the whole of New York. The fire department in New York, that's uh, New York City, they, they, I think their 2023 or 2022 budget is about two point something billion. You understand? Now, but that's what we budgeted for education. Now, you look at health, it's about just uh, two point, I think 2.2 .2 billion US dollars, right? Now, infrastructure, uh, uh, works and housing came to less than a billion, about 800 and something. Let us even call it a billion, right? So you're looking at the major thing that's investment in human capital and investment in critical infrastructures is just six billion. The health budget of New York, I think for 2023, Department of Health, is 203.4 billion US dollars. These things are supposed to act as stimulus to to expand the economy. So what I foresee for Nigerians is that we don't have enough investment to expand the economy. We're just going to be struggling through. But that's the truth. The figures are there. You can't expand more than the amount you inject into the economy. It's not possible. So I think the government needs to, as I said earlier, they need to look for other revenues of generating funds other revenues of uh, uh, basically maybe what we need to do is diversify the economy so that we can start making money from other avenues and then re-injecting them back into the economy through the budget. But as it is right now, we're not going to grow more than the budget. That's the truth. So I think the trillions we hear is it's, 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 
it majorly it, 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 it deceives us. I also uh, perhaps uh, like to hear your thoughts on issues around uh, global events, which has also had a major impact on the continent and Nigeria's economy, not being left out. The issues around the COVID-19 pandemic and, of course, Russia's invasion of Ukraine since February um, this year. Just how much has that, uh, how much of that has impacted uh, the Nigerian economy and even Nigerians? And how have we also handled uh, this uh, global crisis? I'll be very honest, right? I don't envy President Buhari. Let, let, let me just be honest about it. He came in when, and I'm, this is not like making excuses for him, but because there's been, the, what we're suffering today started from the 70s, when we abandoned productivity for a rent-seeking economy, that's the oil sector. And uh, he himself has always been a part of the government right from the 70s, right? But I don't envy him, and I, I'll be very honest with you. He came in, the pandemic, uh, no, it wasn't the pandemic, it was the end of the, the oil boom of the 2000s, right? The oil boom came to an end. And if you watch and look at the economy closely and follow numbers, exactly what happened in the 2000s was what happened in the 70s. There was an oil boom of the 70s that ended in 1980. And from 1981, Nigeria, Nigeria went into recession, right? And the GDP of Nigeria in 1981 was about 164 billion US dollars. It did not take us, no, it took us about 25 years, 24, 25 years. It wasn't until 2005 that our GDP for the first time surpassed what it was in 1981. But then you now need to also look at what factor, right, uh, contributed to that GDP growth of 2005. It was oil. It was crude oil, right? Um, uh, um, the U.S. invading Iraq um, spiked the, the, the price of crude, you understand? Now, when you now look at the events that have always surrounded our economic growth, they are basically orchestrated by wars or instabilities in other regions of the world. We've never had an economic growth that it was basically out of productivity out of innovation, you understand? So going back to your question, President Buhari came in when the oil booms of the 2000s came to an end. The Arab Spring, the invasion of um, uh, Iraq, uh, gas pipeline explosion and, uh, in Nigeria, that of Mexico. So all those things increased crude oil prices in the 2000s. And then the U.S., exactly what they did in 1980, when they saw that there was no end in sight, they passed policies to start drilling oil, creating an oil gloss. Prices now crashed. So by 2013, 2014, prices were already coming down. By 2014, contrary to pub uh, public uh, belief that, oh, this thing started under Buhari, it started right from Jonathan's time. By 2014, Nigeria had started recording trade deficit. 1.86 billion US dollars. And by, by 2020, we had reached 32 billion per year, which is a massive blow, you understand? And then coupled with the fact that COVID came in, if you were very conversant with what was going on, there were vessels on the high sea, nobody buying crude. You can imagine when you lock up an airspace, nobody traveling. So. Uh, planes were not, um, aviation industry were not buying aviation fuel. You understand? So coupled with all that, it, 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 was, it was a crazy time for the economy. But it should also teach us a lesson that we should never put our eggs in one basket. In the 70s, or sorry, in the 60s, if you go look at the trend, we had a very productive economy which was based on agriculture. 54.7% of our GDP was agriculture, and it also accounted for 75% of our external earnings. But events of the 70s, the Yom Kippur War, the Iranian revolutions, the Iran-Iraq uh, uh, War of the 70s, now spiked oil prices to an unprecedented level. Nigeria was awash with petrodollars. And what our leaders did was just, you know what? They abandoned productivity and just, they just went to sleep. And that's the economic model we've been practicing till date. 
if we do not change it, we will be facing the same budgetary problems and challenges every year. So that's the truth. Well, all right, Mr. Roman, that's a good place to anchor our conversation with you. Mr. Roman Osegales, a business and economy intelligence analyst. Thank you so much indeed for your fascinating insights, views and perspective on Business Week. Thank, thank you too. Thank you. And of course, that's a good place to anchor our conversation this week. Thank you so much indeed for watching. I'll be back next week with more insights on the economies here, the continent, and of course, all around the world. I am Kelly Egiga. Bye now.